Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for choosing to spend your lunch hour with us today, and welcome to our third webinar of 2021 in our quarterly webinar series presented by the Business Innovations Department at Androscoggin Home Health Care and Hospice. My name is Julian Netherland, and I am a member of Androscoggin's business development team, along with Lisa Kaye, Sarah Decato, and Sean Hackett. Depending where you're located, you may know one or two or all of us. While our webinar series is new, our face in the community is not. Androscoggin was founded locally in 1966, and today is the largest not-for-profit home health and hospice organization in Maine, serving nearly 450 partner affiliations in more than 185 communities. Because of our nonprofit status, we are able to provide more than $1 million in care each year. We are proud to offer a comprehensive suite of services, including home health care, palliative medicine, and hospice. What this means to our partners is that we are able to provide a seamless continuum of care for your patients as their needs change. These webinars are to serve as a helpful educational resource during this time of being unable to connect in person as we once did. Today's topic is hospice and effective patient care, chosen due to the option it provides patients for improved quality of life as well as overall patient and family experience. Our goal today is to show you what we are doing and how we can help you care for your patients while providing a quality of life that is free of pain and full of meaning. Please know that this webinar is for you, our partners. We encourage you to ask questions as you have them through the chat box so we can be sure to address them and get you the answers you need. To make sure we are presenting our webinar in a way that speaks best to our audience, we are going to begin with a question for you to answer via multiple choice on your screen. Who do we have joining us today? Okay, so it looks like we have a fair amount of nurses with us today with a few social workers and a few of you falling into that other bracket. So a good mix today it should be a good time. So here to discuss with us today all things hospice are our subject matter experts, Karen Burgoyne and Kate Scott. Karen Burgoyne holds an associate's degree in nursing from Revere College in Nashua, New Hampshire, as well as her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from St. Joseph's College of Maine. She has worked at Androscoggin for 15 years, where she started as a hospice nurse. In 2015, Karen became a clinical manager of hospice services before transitioning into her current role as director of hospice services in 2020. In Karen's own words, hospice's focus on the patient's quality of life is what first attracted me to this work. While that continues to motivate me, I am also driven by the holistic interdisciplinary collaboration that is paramount in the delivery of hospice services. Kate Saikot is a graduate of both North Shore Community College in Beverly, Massachusetts, where she earned her associate's degree in nurse education, and Berkshire Community College in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where she earned her associate's degree in business management. Prior to joining Androscoggin in 2010 as the organization's clinical supervisor of hospice house operations, Kate served as a nurse manager, charge nurse, and staff nurse at St. Mary's Regional Medical Center in Lewiston, Maine. Currently, she is the director of hospice centers at Androscoggin. So now to truly get things started, I will turn our webinar over to Karen. Thank you, Jillian, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm delighted that you have all joined Kate and I as we talk to you about hospice services, something we're both very passionate about. As we move through our webinar, some of the things we would like to discuss are uh, uh, the four levels of hospice care, how to determine hospice eligibility, and when a patient can benefit most from hospice referral as well as the differences between home hospice and hospice general inpatient level of care and how to improve the hospice experience for patients and families for improved outcomes. As we start to talk about hospice, it's important to understand that hospice is an end of life medical benefit included with health insurances. But more importantly, it's a philosophy of care and a model of care delivery focused on providing care at the end of life 
this holistic model of care and keeping the patient and family at the center. When talking about end of life goals and hospice, it's important that we're able to communicate with our patients and really get an understanding of what their end of life wishes are. These decisions are deeply personal and can also be influenced by cultural aspects of, of our patients and their families. It's important to have these discussions early because we can never truly understand and foresee uh, everything that will happen. And having these conversations early will help families and decision makers when they do need to make decisions for a loved one. As I mentioned before, hospice is a care delivery model and it's a holistic in nature with the patient and family at the center of all care. There's a great visual later on in the slides, but we'll talk about this a little bit now. Hospice utilizes an interdisciplinary team. So they utilize physicians, nurses, social workers, chaplains, home health aides, volunteers, and a bereavement team. The interdisciplinary team with the patient at the center creates a care plan with the patient-centered goals being the focus. Most hospice care is provided at the patient's home. Hospice neither hastens nor postpones death. And bereavement is an important part of hospice and we follow patients for, or survivors for 13 months post death. Volunteerism is also integral to the care we deliver as we are required by Medicare to have 5% of all care being delivered by volunteers. While most of the hospice care we provide is in patients' homes at routine uh, level of care, there are other levels of care as well. Home care, routine home care, can occur in a patient's independent home, be that a house, an apartment. It could be uh, provided at an assisted living facility or a long-term care facility. We've also provided hospice care in patients' camps if they're there for the summer, um, as well as some transitional housing. Some of our population is not so fortunate to have stable housing. The next level of care is an inpatient respite care. This occurs in contracted facilities, so a facility that contracts with a nursing facility most frequently. And it's really to support caregivers. This caregiving is extremely fatiguing. It takes emotional and physical care to take care of a loved one at home at the end of life. When caregivers need a break so that they continue, can continue to provide the care or when they themselves get sick, Medicare allows for a five-day respite in a contracted facility. The next level of care is a general inpatient level of care. I'm not going to get too much into this as Kate really is a expert on this and I'll allow her to get into detail later on in the presentation. But this is really about active symptoms, patients that symptoms just cannot be controlled um, in another level of care. Continuous home care is very unique and the guidelines for who qualifies for continuous home care are very similar to general inpatient level of care. So again, for symptoms that are unable to be managed at a routine level or in respite, Again, I'll let Kate get into the details of what qualifies and what doesn't qualify, which can be just as important. Continuous home care is in a 24 hour period, a nurse and or a home health aide will be in the home providing care to that patient who is uncomfortable. Contrary to the name, those eight hours don't have to be continuous. It could be blocks of two hours at a time or four hours at a time. This next slide really is the visualization of the interdisciplinary team in hospice, keeping the patient and family at the center. There are also some other members of the interdisciplinary team who may not be on here. Uh, facility staff that are caring for a patient in a facility um, and the attending provider as well is part of that care team. The care team is really responsible for coming together and establishing a plan of care. The goals have, 
for that plan have got to be individualized to the patient and family, and they really have to be specific. They need to include all medications, services, and treatments, including the frequency of visits. The care plan has to be updated. This should be a very fluid um, plan. Patients change quickly, situations change, and goals change. So really allowing that fluidity. The plan must be updated regularly, a minimum of every 15 days or with any significant changes. And there has to be discussion with the care team on ongoing eligibility. It's really a collaborative care planning team. Again, with the patient and family at the center and the patient and family should be contributing to the goals and the care planning. I'm sure many of you have heard about hospice and palliative care and there are differences. And although hospice is a form of palliative care, not all palliative care is hospice. Some of the biggest differences are hospice is a, a benefited um, through Medicare and private insurances. It, there's a payment structure around that. Palliative medicine, there is no Medicare benefit or plan to that. Um, the other criteria that's different is there are very specific eligibility criteria for hospice, which we'll get into in a little bit. One of the criteria is there needs to be a prognosis of six months or less. Palliative care is open. There is no, any stage of illness, serious illness, somebody can access palliative medicine. Services are also different in the two different service lines. Hospice is very service rich. So we come and work as an interdisciplinary team. You get the interdisciplinary team when you elect hospice. Um, you get the nurse and the social worker and the chaplain. You also have medical equipment that can be brought in and medications related to comfort. Bereavement is also very much a part of hospice as mentioned before with support for the family 18 months after. Palliative medicine is more a consulting service and is not a substitute for hospice or other care. Hospice, when somebody elects hospice, they're no longer seeking curative treatment. It's very comfort-based and their goals are focused on that. Palliative medicine, you can continue with curative treatments as well. There is no, um, so as long as the insurance would normally cover those, that would continue. I also think that it's important to mention here that for hospice and palliative medicine, it's, it's for all ages. We do have a pediatric hospice te team and program here at Androscoggin, and we're also starting to discuss a perinatal hospice um, so that we can care for patients throughout the age continuum. Pediatric hospice, differs slightly from our traditional hospice, and I don't wanna get into too many details here, but with pediatric patients, they can receive concurrent care in the state of Maine. So a pediatric patient can continue to receive curative treatment and receive hospice at the same time. They still, however, must have a prognosis of six months or less. Expanded access to hospice care improves outcomes for patients and providers. And I will also add in families here as well. The benefits of early referrals is it allows time to build relationships, the patient and family with the care team. Symptoms are better managed and help to avoid rehospitalizations and ER stays. There's also less suffering. If we can manage symptoms more quickly, there's less suffering. The better, able you're, the better you're able to build trusting relationships, the better bereavement will be. Continuum of care throughout the trajectory of illness, moving these conversations upstream before a patient is really sick or really close to the end of life, avoids crisis care. Going to the ICU, having to have uh, conversations that are really difficult and really stressful times, avoids the emergency department, which we had mentioned earlier. 
it also can improve documentation and communication throughout different settings. So with the home care, with the provider's office, with the hospitals, so help streamline some of that communication. Also improve medication management and coordination of care. The risk of late hospice referrals is, it is considered a negative indicator. Oftentimes we have patients coming on to service and they die less than 24 hours. Um, that's hard for families. It's stressful for families. Um, there's less time for them to benefit from what we've already described as a very service-rich benefit. Nationally, 28% of patients die within seven days of admission. We can do better. A little bit and a very broad overview of hospice eligibility. Patients may be eligible for hospice if their doctor believes that they have a terminal illness with a life expectancy of six months or less. Very difficult to try to um, navigate that. Um, and, and it can be difficult to determine that. If a patient expresses that they're no longer want to continue with curative treatment, if they want to focus on quality of life and comfort, if they want to stay out of the hospital, they don't want to go to the ER, or perhaps they are done with testing. Those might be indicators that they're, they may be ready to have a conversation. So we had talked about needing a, a prognosis and a terminal diagnosis. And how do, what are the, some of the indicators to that it's time clinically? So there's a progression in the disease, their disease. Um, are there, is there dyspnea or shortness of breath at rest? Is there chest pain at rest? Um, are they having some difficulty swallowing? Functionally, are they declining? Were they able to take care of themselves without difficulty a few months ago? And now they have to have help getting dressed. Uh, refractory symptoms that aren't responding to treatment. Is somebody swelling no longer responding to the medication that you're giving them? Is your patient often going to the emergency department? Are they being readmitted frequently? Do you have to call the doctor for updates two and three times a week because a patient is changing? Do you have to have home health nurse come in more frequently because somebody is changing? Those might be indicators that it's time to consider. Is there unintentional weight loss? So they're eating about the same or there's no significant change, but they just are losing weight these might be indications that it's time to consider hospice. CMS or Medicare has really stringent guidelines. What I do want you to take away is that it's the hospice provider will determine what that diagnosis is. The referring provider, the primary provider does not need to figure out that diagnosis. Um, it is that the responsibility on the hospice team. A lot of times we have patients that are, I've had patients referred 104 years old, have only ever taken a Synthroid and an Aspirin, and they really don't have any other diagnoses. But, you know, I think working with the our provider and their attending provider, really able to dig in and find out and give Medicare and CMS what they're looking for. Next, Kate will be reviewing the eligibility guidelines for general inpatient and care at the hospice house. Thank you, Karen. And thank you all for joining us today. I'm happy to share some more information with you about this level of hospice care known as general inpatient level of care. So CMS or Medicare has rules as they do for everything around general inpatient level of care. Um, patients qualify for general inpatient level of care in different ways, and this can be provided um, when and where Medicare indicates. One of them is in hospitals, skilled nursing facilities, or hospitals, um, hospices with inpatient units, where they have nurses available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And those have to be nurses that are in the facility. 
um, not nurses that are available by phone, but actually staffed nurses. It's allowed when a patient's medical condition um, is worsening and it's intended for short-term stays, short-term inpatient stays. Um, so we're talking about when symptoms are severe and they require attention to try and manage those acute or chronic symptoms. Um, and these are symptoms that can't be managed elsewhere. So they can't be managed at home. Um, they can't be managed in a long-term care facility. They need to have an inpatient stay wherever that might be. Um, a patient can qualify for a general inpatient level of care stay if they're a hospitalized patient and they're having ongoing pain um, or symptom management needs, again, that can't be met in another setting. So they can't be sent home from the hospital, they can't be sent to a nursing home from the hospital because their symptoms are so complicated. General inpatient level of care is covered at 100% under the Medicare benefit. And we did just wanna let you know that most private insurances um, operate under the same rules as Medicare when it comes to GIP, although there may be some differences. Some do not cover at 100%. Um, some have high deductibles and others are less stringent when it comes to GIP admissions. Um, so it's good we always reach out to our private insurance companies and um, find out the, that information for our families. Sometimes we're able to um, have people stay and at a GIP level of care longer than they would be if they were using their Medicare benefit. So how does a patient qualify for GIP level of care? Um, first of all, they have to qualify for hospice. They have to be hospice eligible. And that's what Karen has already shared with you. So they have to have a chronic or terminal um, condition and a prognosis of six months or less. And the patient and family have to be on board with the philosophy of hospice and they have to sign the notice of election. Then one of our hospice um, providers completes a certificate of terminal illness and that really um, explains to Medicare why we feel that this patient is eligible for the hospice benefit. So those are things that are done for all hospice patients. Then that hospice patient has to have uncontrolled pain or symptoms to qualify them for a GIP admission. So uncontrolled pain or um, other symptoms or complicated wound care. And we'll get into more details around that. And when is GIP level of care not appropriate? So, um, you know, sometimes we have families who are trying to provide care for their loved one at home under hospice services, and they're just exhausted. Um, as Karen said, it's exhausting to provide care for someone. It's a lot of work. And sometimes families just need a break. And that's when that respite level of hospice care comes into play. So we need to try and find um, respite stay for that patient. They're entitled to five overnights so that the, the family can have a break. Sometimes we use respite when the family um, needs to be hospitalized, the family is sick, um, or the caregiver is going away for a weekend or something like that. Um, GIP level of care is not appropriate when there have been no previous attempts made to manage the symptoms. So when we have patients who are at home or in the hospital, there, have to be, there has to be attempts made to try and manage those symptoms that have failed. Um, so if we have a patient coming in from home, they have to try and manage the pain or whatever symptom the patient is having. And they have to demonstrate that the patient needs a higher level of care. Patient is not eligible for a GIP admission because the home is unsafe. Unfortunately, Medicare says um, they are not you know, going to cover this higher level of care due to an unsafe home environment. 
not appropriate if the family doesn't want to continue, uh, if the family does not want to continue to care for the patient. So um, un that's unfortunate and we do sometimes come up against that, um, but you know, CMS is not going to pay a higher rate unless the patient is actually symptomatic. The patient simply does not want to die at home. And sometimes we have that come up as a problem too for our home hospice patients. We will work with our home hospice team to try and um, the best we can figure out when that patient is nearing end of life and try and do a respite admissions to the hospice house so that the patient is actually here when they die um, and not in the home where it's um, causing great distress to the family. The family is actively, the patient is actively dying, but needs are being met. Again, um, if the needs are being met, then it's not appropriate for GIP admission. So GIP for pain management. Um, this is when a patient is having pain that's not well managed at home or in the hospital, and there is a complicated technical delivery of medication that's required that really needs a skilled nurse um, to manage that pain. And there's frequent calibration or titration of the pain medication and sometimes site care. So sometimes we're giving this medication intravenously, sometimes we're giving it subcutaneously, but it's something that a skilled nurse needs to do, not something that can be done at home. Um, sometimes we're using a PCA pump, which is near impossible to do in a nursing home. And skilled assessment during opioid rotation. So sometimes we have patients who are coming in from uh, home who are on high dose morphine or hydromorphone via PCA pump, and we need to switch them to methadone. That's something that really needs to be done in-house with close observation. Um, frequent evaluation by medical provider or nurse to establish an effective medication regime to reduce pain or other distressing symptoms. So these are patients sometimes who come in who are on high dose oral medications um, but they're still having significant pain. Sometimes we just need to get those patients in, really um, assess them, monitor, make sure they are actually taking all of the prescribed oral doses that are um, assigned to them and make adjustments while we monitor. And sometimes we end up having to flip them to a, a PCA pump. And other times we're able to manage with oral dosing and just getting them on a really effective regime. And aggressive treatment to control severe pain. Unfortunately, sometimes we have patients who come in who are just in a severe pain crisis and we need to be very aggressive in getting their pain under control. So GIP for management of other symptoms. Um, respiratory distress that's intractable or unmanageable. So think about your COPD patients, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, lung cancer patients. And um, these are patients who come in, you know, in severe respiratory distress. Um, and we are working aggressively to get that symptom managed. Uncontrolled nausea or vomiting. Um, a lot of times this is your cancer patients, um, gastric cancer patients. Again, difficult symptom to manage, um, difficult at home. Severe agitated delirium. This is probably the number one symptom that brings people in from the home setting it, because it's very difficult for the family to manage somebody who um, is having agitation and delirium, you know, particularly if they're combative or um, paranoid and accusing the family of stealing their money or those kinds of things. Um, and I think we've all seen these, they tend to progress to the point where the patient refuses to take medication, which just compounds the problem. Um, frequent seizures or new onset of seizures can be very scary um, and requires an inpatient stay, uncontrolled bleeding, and then open wounds um, that require frequent skilled care or complex dressing changes. 
So um, sometimes we have patients who have fungating tumors and require dressing changes a couple times a day um, that would be really difficult for a family to manage at home. Sometimes it's those patients that come in with the very edematous weeping legs that need to have those dressing changes done a couple times a day. And um, sometimes it requires more than one staff person to do those dressing changes. And that makes somebody eligible for GIP admission. Um, acute anxiety or depression requiring extensive interventions. Again, um, it can be debilitating to have the severe anxiety um, and depression. Sometimes we have people who have suicidal ideation. Um, imminent death is somebody is eligible for GIP only if they have a need for skilled nursing care because of pain or symptom management. Um, some, you know, we have lots of patients, um, probably 98% of our patients who are on hospice services die at home on a routine level of care and never ever see an inpatient unit. So only if they're having symptoms that need skilled nursing care. Um, GIP at the hospital. So documentation um, has to demonstrate a decline in condition and uh, need for daily GIP. So this is challenging because hospital staff are trained to document to wellness or document to improvement and demonstrate improvement. And it's really the opposite for hospice patients. We wanna document decline and we want to document why the patient needs to um, continue to be at this higher level of care. And it may be indicated if the patient is receiving hospice services from an organization that does not have an inpatient unit, then you may want to admit the patient to a general inpatient level of care within the hospital. If the patient is receiving services from an organization that does have an inpatient unit, but there are no beds available in the inpatient unit, then you may want to admit um, at the GIP level of care in the hospital. Um, if the patient is in the hospital and is too unstable to transfer to the inpatient unit, um, then you may want to admit at the hospital. And if the patient is in the hospital and travel to the inpatient unit would be a hardship for the patient's family, then you may want to admit there. And we do a lot of this for um, our hospitals that are, you know, a ways away from Auburn, where our IPU is. So this is the hospice house in Auburn, and we just wanted to share this with you. Um, we provide a very home-like environment. I think you can tell by looking at this that this is not a hospital. Um, we really try very hard to maintain that home environment. It's, you know, we, we like to think of it as the best thing other than home. Um, the picture on the left lower corner is a view from the patient's bed. So you can see out into the living room space where there's a pull-out sofa, a queen-size sleeper um, for the families. Families are welcome to be here with their loved one in this comfortable environment. So Dame Cicely Saunders um, was the founder of hospice. She actually started hospice in 1967 in Britain. And she said, how people die remains in the memories of those who live on. And I just think that that's so important. Um, my background is critical care, and I have seen a lot of people die in an int intensive care unit on a ventilator with drips and um, family, you know, making trips in and out of the ICU with all of the sounds and smells and it's very different than being able to gather at the bedside of your loved one, whether that be at home or in an inpatient unit.
So when should providers um, or how should providers make a referral? So think about, providers should think about um, eligibility for hospice. And when the goals are to avoid hospitalization or ED visits, and when the patient states that they no longer want life prolonging treatments, and when the focus is to manage pain and symptoms and to focus on quality of life and end of life care. And when the patient and family chooses their hospice benefit, it makes all the difference in the world. Um, so to make a referral, you simply call our patient service center and we've provided you with the number there. And we're always available to help you navigate this. And if there are questions about eligibility, um, we're always available. Our patient service center is always available and they're skilled in helping people navigate eligibility. All right, so we are going to bring everyone back into the fold um, with some engagement here, asking a question. Um, again, multiple choice, just like our first one. So what would cause you to hesitate to refer a patient to hospice? Okay, looks like we have a mix of answers here. It looks like the majority would be uncertain if the patient or family would welcome end-of-life care, followed next in line by lack of clarity on where to refer, and then fear of causing the patient or family to lose hope. Karen and Kay, I know you have both dealt with all of these things in your line of work. Um, would you care to elaborate or dive into any of these concerns that our audience has? So I certainly um, can understand most of those. Um, I haven't always been a hospice nurse and some of those certainly at some point in my career were things that I uh, thought as well. Um, I would love to take uh, a moment to talk about fear of losing hope. Um, and also, what was the second one again, Jillian? Sorry about that would they welcome the um, end of life care and even end of life discussion? I think this speaks to the importance of moving conversations upstream to have a really good understanding of what patients and families would want, what people would want for themselves. Um, I think it is often people understand they're failing, they know they're failing, um, and by not speaking, you're allowing the elephant in the room to grow and maybe perhaps even creating more fear because it's not being spoken. Um, so as we as a society grapple with um, our fear and our hesitancy to have these conversations in general, moving that upstream so we're having dialogue and we're not afraid of it. Um, is really important, but I can understand where people would be afraid of causing someone to lose hope. Um, and I would also argue that it's not about losing hope, it's about reframing where they're at, and it's about empowering people and allowing people to have their choices and to be heard. It's a, hospice is very patient focused, 
patients have the the right to choose hospice. They have a right to say, I want the entire interdisciplinary team. I want the nurse, I want the social worker. They also have the right to say, I just want the nurse right now. So we're empowering people to make decisions that they want can help alleviate some of that. The other um, question that we received a lot of answers to was unsure of uh, when is the right time to refer? Oh, I can speak to that. The right time to refer is when a patient starts asking questions or when a family member starts asking questions. Um, it's a good time to have a conversation with the patient's uh, primary provider they can usually determine that they feel that the patient has a prognosis of six months or less and they can make a referral and we can work with the patient's pcp and help them determine eligibility it's never wrong to ask the question it's really wrong to not ask And there, you know, I think we're all human and providers are human. And there may be times that the family may be asking and the provider's not sure. And it's never wrong to, to say, can we speak to the hospice to see if it's appropriate, um, to question um, respectfully. Um, but I think it's, it's okay to question. And it's okay to call and say, this is, this is what's going on. What do you get? What do you think of hospice? I know I've had those conversations, and Kate probably has as well. Absolutely, and it, even if now is not the right time, it's it's good to have those conversations and just be upfront about it. I think having everyone have hospice in their forefront is a good idea. So maybe we revisit it again in a couple of months. All right, well, thank you, Karen and Kate, for that enlightening presentation. I think we've all learned a lot. Um, we have been receiving some excellent questions from our audience, and it looks like now would be a good time to dive into those. Our first question here is, how do hospice and GIP hospice differ from your palliative care program? So I did go into that a little bit um, and I can dive into that. GIP hospice and routine hospice, it's different levels, but it's that same um, hospice. Palliative care is different. Um, they do, in palliative care, you do not have to have a prognosis of six months or less. You can continue to seek curative treatment. Hospice is, uh, palliative care, what they don't have is the services attached. It's not a benefit. You know, we talked about hospice being a care delivery model and, you know, palliative care would be more consult, a consultative type service. Um, you go to your doctor and they refer you to a palliative care provider, um, either a nurse practitioner or a, a doctor, and they would do an evaluation and make recommendations similar to any other medical specialty. specialty. Um, and I do think that we have a webinar on palliative care um, yeah. that people would be able to access to get a more uh, a better understanding. Hospice certainly is my specialty. Palliative care, I would defer more to the palliative care team. Hospice is really about focusing on that last six months of life, really focused on comfort, um, patient-centered goals, improving quality of life, and keeping the patient where they want to be for as long as possible. So we have one here. Um... What is a hospice talk? When do I refer to such? So hospice, I'll take this. I think hospice talks happen more in my world than in Kate's world. Um, I think that 
The medical community has come a long way in understanding hospice, um, and we have made great strides in the communities as well. But I think that when we have families and patients either in a in the hospital or in a long-term care facility or an assisted living facility, they may not understand everything that is hospice. A hospice talk is informational gathering. So it allows a representative from hospice to sit down with the patient and family and explain the hospice benefit, what it is, what it isn't, alleviate the fears. There is a real fear that people have that, and I've heard it time and time again, I'm gonna be open to hospice, they're gonna give me morphine and I'm gonna die immediately. That's not the case, not at all. Or the fear that they're gonna send me to the hospice house, I'm not gonna be home and I'm gonna die at the hospice house. There's, and Kate could uh, give this statistics, I think it's about a third of our patients at the hospice house are discharged back home or to their to their to where they were living before. So it allows us to dispel those fears so they're really able to make the choice that's best for them. Giving them information, we can take it in and we can sort of help them with some goals of care questions. Is this really what they want or do they want to continue with a more curative path? But it's information shared both ways. So we had another one come in with a personal story that, Kate, I think this would be a good one for you. I've had two family members at the hospice house. One was there for a couple of weeks and then passed away. The other was there for just a few days and then we were told they didn't qualify and needed to return home. Why is this not the same for everyone? Thank you, Jillian, that is a good question. And the answer really is that patients are different. Everyone is an individual and disease progressions are different. So general inpatient level of care is really based on symptoms. So when a patient has symptoms that need skilled nursing care um, to manage their symptoms, then they continue to be eligible for this level of care. So I would assume that the patient who was here for two weeks um, was continuing to have symptoms that needed that higher level of nursing care to keep them comfortable. And I would assume that the other patient, we were able to get their symptoms well managed um, to the point that they could return to their previous living situation. We sense. have to evaluate every patient here every day um, to determine whether or not they meet eligibility. And that's based on CMS or Medicare guidelines. Thank you, Kate. That makes sense. Um, we have one final one, unless any others come in. Um, this one's kind of fun. Are pets allowed to visit the hospice house? So yes, pets are allowed to visit. Um, we have a waiver that people sign when they come in and they kind of register their pet. It's a very simple form. Um, pets have to be accompanied by a visitor, so they can't be left here unattended with the patient. Um, but yes, we welcome pets and we have had everything from dogs and cats to birds and snakes and ferrets and spiders and <laughs> Yes, I love that. Um, well, it looks like I don't see any more coming through right now. So it looks like that covers the questions we have at this moment. But if you're like me and you think of questions after our time ends today, please do not hesitate to call or email your business development specialist or provider relations consultant, either Sarah, Sean, Lisa, or myself. We are always here to help your patients in any way we can. And we wanna know how we can be of the most help to you when it comes to hospice care. So before we end our time together and move on with our afternoon, please take a moment to answer our final poll question.
If you are still taking the time to answer our question, please feel free to do so. But we just want to thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with us. And we hope you have a phenomenal rest of your day. And we look forward to checking in with you soon.